so there's this lady named Karina, and she comes over and she helps do the floors every so often. Okay. And uh, you know what I mean, like the deep clean in the house, because it's a... Yeah, right on. Yeah, it's something you can't really keep up with if you you know have children and all that. So Karina comes over, and she's in the other room, and right before we record, I was going to talk to her and be like, hey, I'm going to record in the other room, so can you please quit vacuuming, is kind of what I was getting at. There's a lady that works with her that doesn't speak a lot of English, and I said... Uh, <laughs> I said, ¿Cómo se dice en español esto? And I pointed to the vacuum cleaner. I said, ¿Es vacuum? And she said, no, es espiridor. Is that right? Aspirador, aspiradora, I think. Aspirador. Anyway, so she's like, no, that's how you say it. I was like, oh, okay, cool. I was like, en el otro calle. <laughs> I said, uh, oh, what? You uh, told her to uh, vacuum some other street? No, 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 no. <laughs> I screwed all this up, and that's why it's funny. I said, en el otro calle. <laughs> I said, recuerdo mi boca. <laughs> what? And she's like, no. So, no. To, so to be clear, you said vacuum on some other road. Remember my mouth. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> she laughed at me. She's like, no, you're grabador. Uh, gra- grabar? How do you say? How do you say record? Grabar? Gra- grabar. Yeah. Grabar. Yeah. Grabar tu voz, no boca. So she's like, you're going to record your voice, not your mouth. And she's like, you know, gave me the little mental like head pat. Like, it's okay, idiot. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it's, it was pretty cute. I enjoyed it. So um, welcome back to No Dumb Questions, where I, Destin Sandlin, talk to my friend Matt Whitman about all the things that are important in life at any given moment and <laughs> like this like butchering the spanish language together yeah in front of other people yep so destin i saw two gigantic sculptures this week and they affected me and i want to talk to you about them and when i started to broach it with you you were like wait 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 wait, wait. stop talking because i saw giant sculptures too can I know. we talk about giant sculptures yes we can we did that thing where we pause the conversation because it's so good and we're like we, let's just turn on the mics right because yeah, which i i hate it's so unnatural I bet I like giant sculptures for different reasons than you do, um, but I bet some of the reasons I like them are the same as why you like them, if I had to guess. Ah, uh, yeah, you're setting the Venn diagram hook there. All right, yeah. uh, challenge accepted. Yes, I am sure there are different reasons. So you you contacted me about these two sculptures that you saw. I was just coming off of a trip where I saw a giant one. But I've seen many, many more in my lifetime. Like, I've seen a lot of these big, giant statues that people make for various reasons. And I've thought about giant statues that were made in antiquity as well. So how would would you like to do this? Okay, so to be clear, we're not talking about the art of sculpting in general. We're talking about, like, monuments. Big, giant, stand-the-test-of-time, megalithic monuments, right? Yeah, do you, do you want me to just tell you a couple right now that are in my head? Yes, and then I'll tell you a couple that are in my head. Okay, in Birmingham, Alabama, there is a giant sculpture called Vulcan. It is the largest iron sculpture in the world. And it overlooks the entire city of Birmingham. When I was in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro, there's, of course, Christ the Redeemer. I was there last year. I haven't seen that. Yeah. But I've heard of Christ. Yeah, yeah there's that. And, and Brazil. And I was at the Statue of Liberty just the other day. Have you been to uh, Senegal? No, never touched down in Senegal. There's a giant statue in Dakar. It's it's a huge statue of a family. It's a really interesting one. And then there's other ones that I've thought about. But that, I mean, that's, these are the types of grand statues I'm thinking about. And the two that you contacted me about were incredible. Yeah, Mount Rushmore and the Crazy Horse Monument. One of them's done. One of them's got a long ways to go. Yeah. Have you seen either of those? I have not. No, I mean, but the difference in those and the ones I'm talking about, the ones I'm talking about were like created out of nothing and put on a pedestal. Correct. But you're talking about ones that are carved in rock. Now, there's there's Stone Mountain, Georgia. There's there's a big relief that I've seen in Stone Mountain. It's a Confederate uh, general monument there, or memorial, I guess it would oh, be. I always thought it was General Sherman. Um, st- uh, <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> so it took me a second. I was like, no, it's Stonewall Jackson and Robert. That's weird. Didn't oh, you go to idiot. college for history or something? <laughs> idiot. <laughs> no, I doubt they would make I, thank a Thank you for the pause. <laughs> I doubt they would make a monument to Sherman in Atlanta since he burned the whole place down in the American Civil War. 
that anyway. was taken as an affront at the time. <laughs> the, yeah, they, uh, they yeah didn't like that. I've seen Stone Mountain. So I guess you would call Stone Mountain a relief, right? Because it's not a full sculpture. It's like a, a carving that just barely comes out from the rock. Is that right. a fair way to describe it? Yeah, I think so. And that's what you started describing some of the stuff in, in Rushmore and Crazy Horse that I'd never thought about. And that's why I was so interested in this topic. And I was like, please quit talking so we can turn mics on. So can you, in my mind, Mount Rushmore, I've never been, but mm -hmm. it's like in the middle of this wide open plain. I'm assuming South Dakota, you live there now. I'm assuming it's a big plain. There's nothing interesting in South Dakota, right? Except Mount Rushmore. You're Ru mostly right. <laughs> Except Mount Rushmore. <laughs> uh, there's more interesting stuff. All right, we'll talk about that. Continue with your theory. So in my mind, you, you drive up over this long, flat, area like Kansas or something like that. I don't know what I'm talking about. No, Black Hills. So maybe it's Rolling Hills. But you uh, you come up on this area and you see it off in the distance. And as you get closer and closer, there's a bunch of trees and Yogi the Bear is hanging out. And uh, it's just like this really old, I don't know, like Jellystone National Park. Yes-ish. Okay. Most of South Dakota is high plains. It's the transition place between the Midwest, highly agricultural and the West ranching and then up into the high country. So kind of your last batch of mountains from the Rocky Mountain Range is this weird little island of mountains called the Black Hills. That's where I live. The northern end of the Black Hills are the result of just a geologic uplift and volcanic activity. So they're just, I mean, they're mountains. So 7,000 some feet uh, in elevation. It's like a 5,000 foot rise from the flat stuff below. So it's, it's pretty legitimate mountains. I mean, it's not like Rocky Mountain National Park or the Tetons, but it sure feels like mountains when you're in here. And the the central and southern part of the Black Hills are more like those kind of bulbous granite formations. I, that's obviously bulbous is not a technical word, but can you picture what I'm describing? Yeah, like a zit ready to pop on the, on the, yeah. the topography. It's like this big rock sticking out of nowhere. Yes, and nothing grows out of it. It's just a big naked chunk of granite, but they're not they're not like jagged and mean looking like something from like some sort of evil overlord's hideout. They're rounded from time and it's like looking at clouds. When you look at those kind of rock formations, you see stuff in them. You know, squirrels or people's faces or I don't know, like uh, like when you like when you look at clouds and you can see an alligator in there or an umbrella or whatever. It's it's like that, but it's a it's a whole chunk of land that's that way. And so I can totally see how back in the day somebody would come along in these hills and be, you know, going around bends and through little canyons and passes and see these rocks and be picturing stuff up there. And this guy, I think his name was Gutsum Borglum. Uh, I, I'm trying to say his name fast so you can't tell that I don't actually know what all the consonants are. <laughs> he he worked out some kind of deal where he's like, I, I want to put some presidents in the United States up in, in this one particular set of rocks that looks like it would handle four portraits really nicely. So is he like an artist or sculptor? Yeah. What, what was his deal? Well, a sculptor is definitely the profession that would be attached to him, but I don't know, master of logistics, mountain climber, businessman. I mean, really, what would it take to buy a mountain and then mobilize enough people to carve four giant heads into it? That's a lot of talent. It's a lot of overlapping skills. You remember the four presidents who were on there, right? Yeah, it'd be Washington, Jefferson, yep. Yep. Abe, Abe Lincoln, and yep. Teddy Roosevelt. Yes, the first Roosevelt. Yeah. So Roosevelt doesn't really stand in with the rest, because you got like Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln. They're like guys in the 1800s that did huge things, right? But Teddy Roosevelt's well, kind of- Washington's the, earlier, but- yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. But but um, you got Teddy Roosevelt, and is he there because of all he did to preserve the national parks? Is that is that why he is there? You know, I don't know, but I've sat there and wondered that myself. When you go to Mount Rushmore, and they give you you know the little information booklet, or my kids do the Junior Ranger program at any national park, any national monument. Did you know that exists, by the way? Yeah, Emily Grassley talks about it quite often. Like, if she finds a fossil in a national park, she'll go report it to a ranger, and they give her a badge. <laughs> it's really cute. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah, well, yeah. my kids do that, too. You can fill out this little thing, and you answer questions, and then they swear you in. They're like, I'll take care of the national parks and be responsible and respectful. And my kids love it. They've got a stack of badges from all of these different places. Well, while the kids were filling that out, 
all the questions that were asked about Washington, Jefferson, and Lincoln were very obvious. Like, oh, he's up there because he liberated the slaves and won the Civil War and preserved the Union. You know, Jefferson's up there because he's yeah, like the, this great mind that figured out Western liberalism and how to do freedom and a democratic republic. And Washington's up there because he resisted the impulse toward political parties and power and they wanted to make him a king and he wouldn't do it. And he was a great general. But then Roosevelt's a little bit trickier. It's kind of all over and it sort of depends on who you talk to. You know, he he was the trust buster. He's the guy who used the power of the state to fight back against oppressive monopolies. Well, it's not that interesting to a kid who wants a badge, but it's part of his legacy. He's the guy who charged San Juan Hill and and fought in the Caribbean. He's the guy who, you know, speaks softly and carry a big stick. He had a whole bunch of, you know, uh, very formative foreign policy stuff. He's the guy that didn't shoot a bear out of a tree. <laughs> uh, yeah. And he and he's the guy who had the idea to preserve all this land in the West. So, yeah, I think your guess is good. Which is the best idea America has ever had, by the way. It's an incredible idea. What? Why would you say that? Because, I mean, the idea of, well, we have all these resources. Let's just take the land and rape it and do whatever we can with it right now <laughs> and, you know, use this land for whatever we want immediately. The idea of preserving something to cast forward to future generations, I mean, that's selfless, but it's also beautiful, and, and it creates a better world in the long term. It's like a capacitor. It's like moving some of the energy that we have now and preserving it for future generations. I mean, it's it's kind of upside down for what you would think capitalism would want to do, and I just think it's beautiful. It's, it's just such a great idea. Yeah, did you know that basically Grand Teton National Park and a big chunk of Yellowstone were just donated by a super rich guy? Really? Yeah, Rockefeller. When you go to the Tetons or uh, Yellowstone, you drive on the Rockefeller Parkway. That's that's the road. It's, I did not know, realize I assume that. John D, but I, I I I don't know for sure that that's the member of the family. Huh? But yeah. So I agree. I I think it's I think it's a brilliant idea, and maybe that's why Roosevelt you know got on there. Maybe uh, he was just there at the right time. Uh, the other three stand out as more remarkable presidents to me than Roosevelt, but I'm not criticizing Roosevelt to any Roosevelt fans out there. I Googled Rushmore to see what it looked like, and something that never occurred to me is I found a wide shot, and at mm-hmm. the bottom of the mountain there, or the, the side of the hill or whatever that is, I, I don't really have a sense of scale, at the bottom of it, there's this big pile of rocks. Yeah. And it never occurred to me what happened to the rocks as they chipped them off of the mountain to make these statues and I or make these portraits. I, and I guess they just left them at the bottom of the mountain. Is that is that what happened? That's sure what it looks like to me. Uh, yeah, there's just a big rubble pile down there. But it's it's interesting rock because it's all honeycombed. You can see where they used the pneumatic drills to punch into the rock and then dynamite it. So it's all got this cool pattern to it that you would never see in nature, obviously. Really? Yeah. You, you mean like the the rubble has that pattern? Right. Yeah. Every single rock. Well, not every single rock, but tons of those rocks. Just, I mean, you can you can see where the blasting occurred and the drilling occurred to put the charges in there in what's left over. Oh, that's cool. Something I'm concerned about is when you start carving into a material, like woodworkers would know this just naturally by feel, or, or tile, like as you cut tile, you know, you've, you've laid tile floors and stuff, right? I have. So as you cut a tile, you know that if there's an imperfection on the inside of that tile, you always risk, as you're making the cut, just the whole tile breaking in half. Yes. So something that's always scared me about stone statues and things like that is when you're chiseling, maybe there's a fissure that you can't see, and all of a sudden, like, half the, you know, Washington's nose breaks off or something, something you're not expecting. Like, did they talk about that at all at the exhibits? Okay, they didn't, but there's another giant sculpture I want to tell you about. So I'll tie a bow on Mount Rushmore, and then I'll answer that question. Okay. It's, it's amazing that you bring that up. I mean, it's enormously intuitive. Did you ever see North by Northwest with Cary Grant? Nope. God, that's worth your time. Third chair, that's worth your time. That, that is a neat old adventure, high stakes, like almost, it's not a spy adventure, but it has that feel to it. It ends up at Mount Rushmore. And it ends up at Mount Rushmore in the old days of Mount Rushmore when it was all outfitted to look like 
kind of old faithful. Have you been to Yellowstone yet? I still haven't, man. I, I feel shame in that, I, but no, I haven't. Man, I mean, you got out to the West to see me one time, but it literally re- required an alignment of four celestial bodies. It did. To make that happen. <laughs> I mean, that's more than it took for the wise men to go see baby Jesus. We, yeah. <laughs> we got to get you out here, dude. We need a tour of the West. I know. Um, h- how do you picture Old Faithful, like architecturally? Old Faithful, in my head, is just like uh, may- maybe some hills around the outside, like a bowl kind of thing. And then down in the bottom, there's just like this flat area and a geyser that you can just walk up. And maybe there's like a little rope around it with some, like, or maybe a chain that keeps you from getting in the little geyser pool. That's, in my head, that's what it looks like. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're in the zip code. It is kind of a basin. And all the architecture there is this 19th century gigantic log timber construction. It's just gorgeous, breathtaking. And that's kind of what uh, Mount Rushmore used to look like. It was that woodsy, timbery, piney, mountain goats wandering around kind of construction. It was very homey and folksy, and it kind of accentuated the idea that these guys are citizen presidents, and they're not you know, professional dictators or something. They did their little term, and they were done. And I really liked the way it worked. And then at some point, they bulldozed all of that. They came in, and they put up polished granite, Greek god, pantheon, marble stuff, and it, it doesn't resonate as well with me now. But just down the street, there's another monument, just down the street, like 30 miles, a little further south in the Black Hills, to the Native American leader, Crazy Horse. Have you ever heard of him? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, there's, there's these Native American leaders or Indian leaders that you hear about all the time, you know, cr- Crazy Horse, Sitting Bull, mm-hmm. um, people like that. But I don't really know what they did. I mean, I, I don't know what he's known for, and you know, obviously he's a hero of some type. But I don't know, I don't know what he did other than you know he, he's just this big figure in history in in the back of my mind. But please tell okay. me what he did. Yeah, and that's that's reasonable because I think this is the kind of thing that is going to be taught more in schools if you kind of live out in this neck of the woods. The same way when I go to Alabama, I'm learning a zillion things about local history that I've never heard of out here. That's pretty common knowledge to you guys having grown up there. So no shame on not having the Crazy Horse details. I don't, I don't have them all either. W- was Crazy Horse at the Battle of Wounded Knee? Uh, Little Bighorn Little Big is Horn. the famous battle he was at. Yep. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. So the Battle of Little Bighorn, that is... Custer. 1876. Yeah, very good. George Armstrong Custer was the guy who fought there. And what's so remarkable about that battle is that it was a crushing defeat for the American cavalry... And essentially a complete and total victory, an annihilation victory for the Lakota, the Sioux, the Cheyenne, the Arapaho. I think that's right. Um, but the, the Lakota, Sioux, for sure. And Crazy Horse was the guy who was like, hey, enough of this crap. I can see the writing on the wall. This is never going to end. The whites, the Americans are going to continue to push west. And eventually everything about us, it just doesn't jive with the future of where all this is headed. So after the Sand Creek Massacre, which happened in Colorado in the 1860s, where some jack wagon military commander just went off on his own. His, his captains didn't even want to go along with it. They didn't fire. But this, this one dude, uh, Shivington was his name, just murdered like 600 and some women and children. And a few dudes were there, too. What? It, it changed the entire, yeah, 1864, Sand Creek Massacre. Have you heard of that before? No, I haven't. Dude, I'm telling you, that Sand Creek Massacre doesn't happen, and maybe this whole story plays out differently. It was so pivotal because the people who got killed at Sand Creek were overwhelmingly sympathetic to working out some kind of long-term mega plan that could make this whole thing work in the western half of the United States. Like, Obviously, it was never going to go back to the have-roaming tribes covering huge swaths of land. But the plans that were cropping up and that there was some momentum for, it would have worked a lot better than what ended up happening. And this bloodthirsty Shivington guy, who unfortunately was a Christian minister, he ignored the advice of his subordinates who were like, we can't fire on them. This isn't a war party that we're not here to fight. And he sent his men in and they just, the the accounts are horrifying of what happened there. There's congressional hearings. Shivington was utterly condemned for his behavior and all of this goes on record and so the whole crazy horse thing is like a 10 year long 
retribution for what broke down and fell apart after the Sand Creek Massacre. So Crazy Horse then, he's kind of like this embodiment of the spirit of the Native American West and being like, look, we were willing to play ball, but not like this. And we're just not going down without a fight. And boy, did he go down with a fight. Just an incredible warrior by all accounts from both sides of the conflict. And um, he died in a cowardly way. He was arrested and I guess was going to be tried at Fort Robinson in western Nebraska. And people claimed that he tried to escape, but basically he just got bayoneted in the back by some guy. Really? So Crazy Horse is a pretty a pretty dear figure to the Native Americans of the West. Wait, wait, wait. Who killed Crazy Horse? Uh, some guy. Some low-ranking dude who was doing a prisoner transfer at Fort Robinson in western Nebraska near Scotts Bluff. And that's kind of it. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm I'm silent because I'm like, why? Why? Why did he? Why did he kill him? It sounds kind of like when Archimedes was killed in Syracuse, just like some soldier walks in and he's an idiot, and you know, Archimedes is like, don't, don't disturb my circles, and he just gets speared. Are you familiar with that story? No, I've never heard that story. Archimedes, he's just working, and yeah, yeah, they, they were they were being invaded by the Romans, I believe, and he's in his house chilling i guess and he's working on some math and archimedes math was incredible i found a book of it the other day and i looked at it and i was like whoa 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 i thought he just like tied some strings around trees and then approximated pi but this joker was doing like hardcore geometry Hmm. and so this roman soldier walks in and archimedes is like writing stuff on the ground he says don't disturb my circles that's that's the famous quote I'm, i'm googling it my circles I believe that's it. Yeah. Uh, Noli turbare circulos meos. I don't know what that <laughs> means. According to, that was the, the phrase uttered by the ancient Greek mathematician and astronomer Archimedes when Romans conquered the city and they, they killed him. Anyway, that sounds like just some soldier that doesn't know the gravity of the situation just right. killed Crazy Horse without really understanding what he was doing. Is that, is that the way it fell apart? in your mind? That's the way the story has always felt to me. And I've been to all of these places. I've been to Little Bighorn on more than one occasion. I've been to Fort Robinson. I mean, this this is like my story. This is what I grew up around. Hmm. And and frankly, um, I don't know, you've been to the Wind Indian Reservation with me. That's, that is where we watched the eclipse happen. We were on the reservation, and that is an Arapaho and Shoshone reservation. So, I mean, the story overlaps with you, too, even in, in how it played out that we had to, you know, make the clever maneuvers we made to get on the land to watch the eclipse. Wow. Okay. So, yeah, I think there was a way better way this could have played out. And it played out very ugly and continues, I think, to be just difficult and hurtful and and tough. But Crazy Horse is cool. He fought back. Other people, you know, it's kind of like uh, Xavier and Magneto. Other people took the Xavier approach and were like, no, we have to negotiate and work this out. And he's like, after Sand Creek, screw it. I'm going full Magneto approach. And so he fought, and I can't blame him for fighting. If somebody crazy came horse did that did? to my place, I'd fight back too. Yeah, yeah, crazy horse. Have you ever thought about that? Like, all of the energy of your mind, like, and, and the the peaceful tendencies that you have and, and the desire for peace and all that, have you ever thought what would happen if just everything breaks and you were to apply <laughs> your whole force of being for not evil, but like, military strength. Have you ever thought about that? I think that's the premise of the Punisher, right? Frank Castle, <laughs> like he loses everything and he applies all of his skills and mind. I'm not talking about a movie. I'm talking about you. Have you ever thought about that? Well, yeah. And I'm saying I have when I watched the Punisher, like that, that made me think about it. Like what, what if you had nothing, but you were still alive and you put all your mind toward violence or revenge or straightening out some kind of wrong. I tend to think of it when I'm not watching The Punisher, I tend to game that out more in in the post-apocalyptic, what if everything broke and I loved everybody, I you know I lost everybody I loved, what would I do? How would I survive? Where do you go? Who do you associate with? So I don't know. It sounds like I haven't gamed it out as much as maybe you have, but yeah, it's crossed my mind. What do you think about it? Yeah, I've gamed it out. <laughs> I've gamed it out. I'm okay. like, man, man. Clearly. Yeah, you know, if... For example, when you think about all these past wars in the past and you think about 
obviously the past wars are in the past, but you think about these people that were put in impossible situations, and they were like, well, um, we're going to do this to all of your family, and I guess you could fight if you want to, but there's no way you're going to win. Mm-hmm. And like, mm-hmm. what you would do as a person to, to figure out how to survive and how to, you know, just think about World War II and, and the French people that were, you know, the, the nation surrendered very quickly, but you had all these people that were sabotaging these things, and it's just, I don't know, that this, I hope I'm never put in a situation like that, ever, <laughs> but I've, I, I can imagine how a person like Crazy Horse would try to work things out correctly, you know, with honor, and then realize at some point, oh, it's not going to work, we, we've got to play by their rules, and I'm going to be better at them, at their game. That's that's kind of the impression I get. Yeah, if they speak violence, I'll speak violence. That seems to be his response. Right. Which I'm not a fan of, but it's really hard for me to condemn his actions. Why not fight back? I mean, it's like the the situation where you sit there and do nothing. Like watching my team down nine points with five and a half minutes to go in the fourth quarter of a football game, and it's fourth and four from the 50-yard line, and they punt. It's like, oh, you just decided to lose. And for third chair members who don't speak football, that that's just the equivalent of rolling over, going down without a fight. And I don't, I don't think I'd want to do that. I mean, this guy was smart. He could read the writing on the wall and he knew it was going to go down probably one way or the other. So he chose to go down with a fight and I respect it. And this guy uh, who carved this crazy horse monument, no, carved isn't the right word, man, because crazy horse isn't done. Had you heard that there was a monument to him that was going up in the Black Hills? Yes, I have. And I heard it was huge. Huge, brother. Like, uh, I've heard that Mount Rushmore could fit in his armpit. Wow. So the sculpture itself is a general likeness of Crazy Horse. Nobody is really sure what he looked like. Some of the pictures that it's claimed are Crazy Horse are disputed. So it's kind of this... This image of the determination of the Native American resistance in the West, that that's the expression they put on his face. And only his face is done. But what it's going to be is this Native American leader on horseback pointing forward and like his, his hair and the horse's mane and all of that is getting carved in this mountain. And again, Mount Rushmore fits in the armpit. It's nuts. So do you have to pay and, to park there? <laughs> 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 you ask the right questions. Um, no, you pay for admission. So you can see the thing dang well from the road, but you pay to go in. We paid 30 bucks to take my family of five. And the reason I didn't care one bit is because it's totally privately funded. This guy, uh, his name was Korshak uh, Zolkowski, maybe is his last name. I feel like I butcher his last name. That's Korshak is his first name, though. He's the dude who decided to carve the thing, and the government came along and was like, here's $10 million to help make that happen. And, and maybe they were there with the right motives. I, I don't know. But he's like, heck no. No, I'm not, I'm not taking $10 million of money from the government who did this to commemorate what that government did. No, it's, it's going to be funded privately. And so he's never taken a penny of any kind of state funding at all to make this monument. So for me, paying 30 bucks to go in there and park and walk around, it's like, I don't feel bad about that at all. I'm, I'm, I helped build that thing by paying my 30 bucks, you know? So you're saying that, well, first of all, how, how long is it taking to do this? Like, how long has this thing been going? Yeah, uh, about that. It's going to take a minute. I think he started in the 1940s. He, 40s? Uh, Korshak, yeah, Korshak so he's, was... So he's dead. He is dead. He died in 1982. I believe. Okay. And he was from maybe Boston, Connecticut, something like that, and met some Native American leaders. And they were like, we would like you to make a monument to the Native American West. And he's a great sculptor as a kid. Great sculptor, man. He did. I, I'm talking a lot. Are you still like, is it cool if I tell you a little bit more about this guy or <laughs> am I getting too into it? Yeah, go ahead. I mean, I would like more specifics. You're kind of, I, I can feel the emotion, but I'm not, I'm not learning an incredible amount because I, I just want to know more about like the specifics of it, if that makes any sense. Sure. I'll tell you the specifics about the guy. Hey, this episode of No Dumb Questions is brought to you by HelloFresh. 
You can get mouthwatering seasonal recipes and pre-measured ingredients delivered right to your door with HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. HelloFresh makes cooking at home fun, easy, and affordable. What's the cool stuff about HelloFresh, buddy? Well, it's delicious. Did I tell you I have a new HelloFresh meal that is now my favorite? No. Yep. No, you have not told I, me that I yet. I do, and you need to try it. It's called Tuscan Sausage and Pepper Spaghetti. I don't know how you are on spicy stuff, but this isn't spicy. It's like right at the edge of spicy, but not actually spicy. But um, I cooked this thing, and I hoarded the leftovers so that only I could eat it because it was that good. This Tuscan sausage spaghetti might take over the steak and sass. It might. It's pretty impressive. Okay. Okay. I don't want to ask you to settle down because I'm really glad you're excited about it, but that steak and sass is um, I know. It's pretty special. I know what I said. What I like about the thing is that it's quick. I'm reading a statistic here that the average time to go to the grocery store, uh, there's an insti- a, a group called the Time Institute. They measure these things. 41 minutes to go to the grocery store for a normal person, which is like 35 hours a year, I'm told. And this just shows up at my place and then I cook it. 30 minutes. I don't have to think. I don't have to know what kind of ingredients to get or shop through those. The ingredients are right and it simplifies life enormously. That's probably the thing that has helped my family the most about this is it makes the chaos go away. Here's some other data (laughs) that I have. Okay. There's finally been a study done by the University of Michigan and turns out it is basically more sustainable to use HelloFresh. They say that your carbon footprint is 25% lower than store-bought grocery meals, plus you don't waste as much food. I thought that was awesome. It's actually more sustainable to use HelloFresh. Yeah. I certainly don't waste as much food when I cook with the pre-measured ingredients, that's for sure. Well, and the other thing that's efficient is the flexibility factor, just not having to be locked into a thing forever, but instead having the ability to get it when you want it. And when you're traveling, like I'm going to be here coming up for a little bit. You coming to visit? Just turn the thing off. You coming to visit? You pick it right up. I am. Awesome. Yeah, I'm absolutely coming down to visit. Pause that HelloFresh and come visit, my friend. That's going to be awesome. I will pause the HelloFresh. I will come visit and we will play basketball and racquetball. Racquetball. I believe those are the terms, correct? Yeah, racquetball. We've got to play racquetball. We need to go to like an inner city league. Heck yeah. Let's do it. Let's totally do that. That's going to be fun. Yeah. I don't know, man. I, I like your chances at the racquetball because it's all angles. And I feel like of the two of us, you think more in those categories than me. I'm going to level with you. I understand how a corner reflector works, and I can make the ball go into the corner and come out if there were no spin on the ball. But because the racquetball is so sticky and it changes direction when it bounces, I can't figure it out. Okay, so this is the deal. If you want to try HelloFresh, because it's amazing, and you should, and it's good for everything, your family included, you can do this by going to HelloFresh.com slash NDQ10 and use the code NDQ10 during HelloFresh's New Year's sale for 10 free meals including free shipping. Again, that's HelloFresh.com slash NDQ10. It's awesome. So you should totally do this. It seems like they keep making it better, man. They do. It's only five sixty six per serving now. It's like they're honing the craft of getting delicious meals to your house. So anyway, give it a shot. That supports the podcast. It supports us, and uh, we appreciate it. Again, that's HelloFresh.com slash NDQ10 for 10 free meals, including free shipping. Well, thanks, HelloFresh, for supporting us. Thanks, everybody who buys HelloFresh. And indirectly supports the podcast through that. Tuscan sausage pepper spaghetti. That's the one. So Korshak, he became a sculptor as a very young man. He was just gifted for it. And he liked to carve things out of things as opposed to, you know, like like use clay to build things out of nothing. The contrast we were discussing. It's additive, like additive sculpture instead of subtractive. yeah. 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 So he comes out, he builds his studio and... Housed in it still, in his original log studio from the 1940s, are a bunch of things that he sculpted along the way. And one of them is made out of driftwood from Boston Harbor, and it's called like Old Pagan or something like that. And it's a super old dude. This thing must have been sculpted around, you know, the World War II, something like that. And it's this this shirtless sailor who apparently eccentrically memorized all of Shakespeare And then famously would just quote entire plays at sea as he sailed in and out of Boston Harbor in the 1800s and early 1900s. And right at the end of his life, Korshak went and met this guy and sculpted him. And it was so moving. It was like a a connection over time between me and this dude I'll never meet because we weren't even close to living at the same time. But I did overlap lifetime wise with Korshak. And I, I guess what I'm saying is his sculpture was powerful enough to make me feel things 
in an image to make me think about time and my life and the timelessness of art. And so to take something like that and to try to blow it up to a scale that's maybe the biggest carved monument on earth, I would have to think it is, is an enormous undertaking, but it's working, dude. Crazy Horse, his face is done and the expression is already emotionally powerful. So whatever the case, Korshak worked on that face for ages and brought his family on board and it's gone slow because they're not they're not taking public money, but they think maybe another generation or two is what it's going to take. Maybe a 100 150 year sculpture process is what they're looking at. That's amazing. Were they actively like tink 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 were they sculpting the day you were there? Uh yeah, yeah, people were working. I mean it was a cold day. It was uh middle of winter. But you remember you asked about um fissures or faults within within whatever you're carving and, and how do you account for that? Uh, right. We were talking about Mount Rushmore, right? So uh joining the pin in that, that was one of the things that they were talking about as they were carving. They're like, right now we're trying to take account of what's going on inside the rock here on the arm. And we're using this technology and that technology, and uh, it wasn't explained in detail, to detect where weaknesses or problem spots might be so we don't break something we can't ever fix. So somehow they are accounting for that. That's cool. That's really cool. Yeah, and the, I mean, you kind of picture like people with chisels, right? But you look up on his arm and there's like, gigantic bulldozers and excavators. Uh, you could play football on his arm, I think, if you wanted to. It's, it's just, it's like an aircraft carrier deck. You maybe land a small plane on his outstretched arm. It's it's incredible. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the, uh, I've got some dimensions here. It looks like the arm is 263 feet long. That's nuts. Almost football. Yep. That is crazy. It says there's a feather. So there's a feather going to go on his head. Is that going to be made out of like, what does that mean? Yeah, I can't tell if it's a feather or if it's like his hair and like kind of thick locks flowing backwards. Yeah. I, I don't know for sure. But here's what's amazing, man. They're going to put this plaque that's going to be like the size of your house flipped on its side and stuck on the side of a mountain. They're, they're carving this out of the side of the mountain. And the plaque are some words that Korshak wrote, something like, you say we're without land, but my land is wherever my people died wherever my people are buried. So with with that plastered on the side of the mountain and crazy horse pointing off into the distance, my lands are where my dead lie buried. That's the line. That's It's powerful. Essentially, this whole statue or monument is just a big middle finger to the United States, would you say? Maybe in a good way. There's a ton of things I love about the United States, but yeah, I, I think I think what it's trying to say is we aren't conquered because we can't be conquered because our lands are where our dead lie buried. Gotcha. It's a memorial in the truest sense of the word. It's it's a, you know, it's it's something that will go forward to future generations and like, whoa, who would carve such a crazy thing? Yeah. And is that what you think when you see a skull? I mean, how quickly does your brain go to, wow, that's really pretty, and then skip forward to, why would somebody do that? What must have been the circumstances that would make someone invest this in this? So we recently went to New York, and my daughter wanted to go to Ellis Island because she has read, um, she's read books about Ellis Island, about immigration, and all these types of things, and it was just very interesting to her. So before we went to Ellis Island, we decided to go to the Statue of Liberty, which is on an adjacent island. It's called Liberty Island. Mm-hmm. And just the whole idea of, you know what, we're going to take a lot of money— and we're going to create this huge statue. Just that mm-hmm. in itself is fascinating. That's interesting because that, as a whole culture, you have to come together and be like, you know what? We, we could buy corn or wheat or make machines or airplanes with this, but we're going to set it aside and we're going to make a thing that outlives us. That in itself takes a certain amount of forethought, cooperation. It, t- it takes a lot and what's so interesting about the Statue of Liberty is that it was done by the French. The French did it for America. Yeah, it was a present, right? Yes, it was a gift. Um, the way they did it was really interesting. They they created the statue in France. Th- there's this guy, uh, Frederic Bartoli. He created this thing, and, and he just, he it was his idea. He really wanted to make this huge thing 
It's called officially Liberty Enlightening the World, which most people call Really? The that's sta- the name of it? Yeah, it's called Liberty Enlightening the World. It's not the Statue of Liberty. I had no idea. Yeah, that's the title I, but of it. But you're telling me that that it was not made by Gustav Eiffel? I, I always thought the Eiffel Tower guy is the one who did the Statue of Liberty. No, no, no. Bart- Bartoldi was the guy. Like, he was the guy that designed it. He came up with it. But he he reached out to uh, the Eiffel guy for the structural engineering on the inside. He, he's like, hey, I need help. Um, I'm really good at this. You're really good at that. Let's work together. Like, the base of the, the Statue of Liberty, that was made by America. That was a famous architect. Let me find out who... His, I, I knew it. This is funny as you're looking it up because... Like I knew it was a gift from France. I knew Eiffel was involved somehow, but it's almost so iconic that I've never actually thought about the thing. I don't Mor- know anything about the Statue of Liberty. I yeah. would have said it was on Ellis Island. I didn't even have that right. Morris Hunt is the guy that designed the the pedestal for the Statue of Liberty. And what was so fascinating is th- they were in correspondence together. So there were there were drawings that went back and forth between the U.S. and France, and they. You know, he was like, I don't know, that pedestal looks okay, but that one's not, eh, I don't know about that. And so finally, the, the challenge was you had to make a pedestal that was really good looking, if you will, but didn't eclipse the the statue itself. You wanted it to complement the statue, but not overpower it. And I think, I think Hunt did a great job with that. Anyway, the Statue of Liberty is fascinating. It was done with copper. And the process was fascinating. So they created a small statue, and then they set up a truss structure around it. Like when I say small statue, like very tiny, you know, something that you and I could approach and like hold a ruler up to and start looking at and things like that. But they okay, like life size or smaller, right? Okay. But what they did is they created these boards. Like if you can imagine boards um, above the statue. And you could take like a level across those boards and then drop a plumb bob down from the top of that board and you could measure the length of the string. And then you could measure over this much. And so what they would do is they would extrapolate the small dimensions from the statue to the larger dimensions. Have you ever done 3D printing? Have you ever done any type of additive manufacturing at all? Have you ever done anything like that? No, I've watched Joel's channel a little bit, 3D printing nerd, but I've not done it myself. Yeah, there, there's so many neat things about 3D printing, but one thing that I, just the simple geometry of it's interesting. You have X, Y, Z coordinates, and you can you can scale it up and scale it down, things of that nature. So just the process of seeing the small statue and how they made these dimensions, and then they just scaled it up. They literally multiplied by a scalar, and then they had to create these forms. And so, for example, the toenail for the Statue of Liberty you have to make a reverse toe out of wood and then you take these copper sheets and you hammer these these copper sheets into that reverse toe made out of wood. That's how you do it. And then you go on the inside and you create what they did originally is they had these iron straps that they would put in there and these iron straps they would bolt to the copper. It's fascinating. But if you think about the shape of the inside of a statue like that, it's not like a cylinder. So you can't just, you know, radially bolt a strap, whatever it is, 10 10 meters in diameter. You can't just radially pull things and strap them in. You have to make each individual piece custom because the statue is so complicated. You with me? Okay, I I was with you till the last phrase. You have to make each individual piece custom. Are you saying that the statue itself is made of several pieces later assembled? Yes, or exactly. Or each individual piece. Okay, all right, I'm tracking then. Yes, but, so there's two components to it. There's the outside structure that's made out of copper. Mm-hmm. That's the outer shell. And then there's the internal structure. Eiffel made that, but you have to connect those two together. So you've got the truss work on the inside, you got the statue on the outside, but you have to have a physical, uh, like, material interface between the copper and that inner that inner truss structure. And so those are straps that they would create okay. and they would bolt them in place. Or in some cases... Is that still there? Yeah. In the 80s, they redid it. They're like, oh, wow, we've got all this iron on the inside here, but, you know, it's not, it's not watertight, so the inside of the statue leaks. So they went back in the 80s and they completely redid 
the inner workings of that with stainless steel. That had to have been hundreds of dollars. Yeah, I mean, yeah, dozens, dozens of dollars. But what was really <laughs> cool about it is they... But, but again, right there, but again, right there, somebody made a cultural decision to spend unfathomable amounts of money on a statue. And we got to come back to why, because that was a great question you asked. Sorry, continue. Yeah, w- what's really interesting is when they did that, though, they got French craftsmen to come over and do it because it was originally a gift from the French. And when they went back on the inside and they redid the internal workings, the, the French did that as well, which is awesome. Isn't that cool? I didn't know. I was going to say I'm embarrassed. I'm not embarrassed. It's okay to not know things. It's okay to not know things that are in plain sight. I just didn't know any of that. And it, it's a healthy reminder for how many gaps I have in what I know about even my own country's past. But no, that's fascinating. I mean, now that you mention it, I do remember kind of, a, was there an unveiling ceremony or something in the late eighties or maybe early nineties when they finished all of that restoration stuff? I think I remember seeing all the scaffolding and everything as a kid, but I, I've never been to the Island itself. I've only seen it from a ways away. Did, did you guys go to the Island itself? Yeah, we went to the island itself. I've never been up in the statue. It's like, you know, you have to get tickets way ahead of time in order to do that. So I've never actually been up in there. But um, yeah, we, this is the second time I've been to the island. And I think I appreciated it a lot more this time because I had a little bit more engineering knowledge this time than when I went the first time. I, I think I went when I was in college then, but I've taken a lot of a lot of classes in grad school since then about stresses and things of that nature. So I really appreciated it for what it was this time a whole lot more but it's one thing to appreciate the mechanical design and just the grand scale of something like this and and just the the social willpower it takes and the political willpower it takes to make something like this like it uh, if i if i understand correctly he sold bonds to do it i may be getting that wrong but it's just fascinating the, the way it all went down but i really find it fascinating for what it represents Like, just across the water there at Ellis Island, you had people that were waiting in line. There's this grand hall in Ellis Island where people were, like, literally waiting in queues to be registered as immigrants. And you could see— Yeah, our last names probably changed there. Did it really? Well, I mean, maybe yours, maybe mine. I don't know when the Sandlins made it to this continent, but when the Whitmans left England, at least some of them, their last name was our last name was Whiteman, W-I-G-H-T-M-A-N. But as I've told you before, my family had a run-in religiously and politically with the crown, and gradually we relocated, I think, in part because of that at least. I mean, they burned my granddaddy to death for thinking the wrong stuff about Jesus. So you Did know, they really? You can't, yeah. I'm directly descended from the last guy to be burned at the stake for a religious offense in the U.K., Oh, wow. But the last name was pronounced Whiteman and spelled Whiteman. And so I don't know if it was at Ellis Island that that change actually happened, but I know a whole lot of people effectively received a new name as they passed through that place. And I mean, that's almost biblical at that point. Like you receive this new name and you're this new person for all of eternity moving forward as just how many stories got rewritten as they waited in that hall that you're describing. It's uh, it's a fascinating place. Oh yeah, the hall was interesting, man. I really, uh, I don't know. I spent a lot of time there. We, we as a family, we went to it, and we just like separated there. We're like, okay, cool. I could tell that my daughter was bothered a little bit by being there. She was on edge, and I didn't really understand Father. why. And I think she had read a lot of books that I'm not privy to. So we, we just like, hey, just go wander around, do whatever you want. I'm gonna go wander. You go wander. Let's just do our own things. It's really interesting to walk those halls alone. And just think about all the the things that changed there. They have a really good exhibit of things that people brought with them. Like if you could put everything that's important to you in one suitcase, what would it be? And back in the day, it was a lot of photographs. That was very important. Mm. Yeah, it, it would be a hard drive for me today. It would, yeah. It'd be a hard drive for me as mm-hmm. well. It was just fascinating to see the vantage point from Ellis Island looking over at the Statue of Liberty and knowing what it represented Another really interesting thing that they had at the exhibit on Liberty Island itself was the lamp at the top of the Statue of Liberty. Do you know what the lamp looks like? I mean, I can picture the sculpture. I picture it being kind of mesh, 
and uh-huh. actually illuminating. Is that right, or am I making things up? That's the way it used to be. So, oh, okay. It has changed many, many times over the years. So at one point, it was changed to this like stained glass structure where you had all these little, I'm, I'm making a little circle with my fingers right now, th- these little grids, like a honeycomb looking pattern almost, but not as organized. And they would have a lamp on the inside, so it would serve as a lighthouse. But the original design, Bartoli wanted it to be just a gold lamp. He wanted the lamp to be gilded and illuminated externally. And they didn't go with that. They tried a bunch of weird stuff. They tried to like light it red, white, and blue at one point in time. They did all this jacked up stuff and then eventually they just came back around and like you know what 100 years ago he had a pretty good idea with just making it gold so they did that and so now it's just gold but it's illuminated externally yeah i've seen that okay yep i can picture that but i'm not crazy i have pictured the kind of mesh work lit from within thing as well right it's just that you're telling me that's not there anymore right yeah they they have that lamp maybe it got damaged in the uh x-men versus (laughs) magneto's acolytes attack of 1998 (laughs) They do have the uh, the old lamp that you're thinking about. They have it there in the museum, which is fascinating. But okay. we'll, I don't know. I just think the Statue of Liberty is amazing for many different reasons. It was an external gift given to the United States by the French, and it's it just means a lot. Can I ask you a question about that statement right there? Sure. It means a whole lot. Okay, Mount Rushmore, I think, is a monument to the idea of an amateur citizen governor a citizen president as opposed to a king or an emperor with liberty as their chief objective. I think Crazy Horse is, hey, a thousand years from now, we want people to remember that these people were here and that because of our own ground rules of what it is for us to have the land, we were never conquered and we can never be conquered. What do you think the Statue of Liberty means? Freedom. Period. Freedom. You know I'm not into that freedom in general. <laughs> yeah, know, exactly. Troubles me. <laughs> There's there are shackles laying at the feet of the statue. Um There are? Yeah, there there's Good there's heavens. broken chains at the feet of the statue. Um really. And, yeah. She's walking forward uh you know commemorating the recent abolition of slavery. There's you know okay, so this yeah, this was dedicated after but 20 years after the Civil War, something like that. I don't know the exact year. 1880s, yeah. 18, I'm looking 86, yeah, 1886. 1886. Yep. I don't know. It's, it's just an amazing work of, of art and symbology. And it makes me think about, why don't we do things like that now? I mean, do you know of anybody that besides this yes. crazy horse monument, they're like, you know what? We need a really big statue right here. To I, do. I know a lot of people who are taking statues down. Yeah. And you're going to be tempted. You're going to be tempted to go right to the South and be like, and I have no interest in <laughs> debate or arguing about, you know, whether... General Lee should be pulled down from all these places. Nah, forget it. I'll engage it. I I don't think it's a good idea. I think monuments are monuments and you assign meaning to them as you want to. But it's not just stuff like that. I mean, even in San Francisco last year, they had a mural that was painted as a criticism of the United States from a, a pretty Marxist point of view. But even the depiction of the stuff that the United States, I happen to agree with the Marxists on this point, got wrong. Even that was offensive to people. So it's like a $600,000 environmental study giant thing to get that taken down. So there, there's a lot of impulse right now to get rid of monuments. But I agree with you. It doesn't seem like there's nearly as much impulse right now to make new monuments. And I bet we have the same rationale for why. But I want to hear your thought as to why we're not making stuff like this anymore. Oh, I don't know. I, I haven't actually thought about it. I, I do know that there is this tendency towards... Uh, erasing the over history, you think about these large statues. Are you familiar with? Is it the Colossus, the large statue? Well, go to Game of yeah. Thrones. You know, in Game of Thrones, that was that was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I see where you're going with this. Yeah, this. It, what is the city in Game of Thrones that had this huge statue, and you had to sail between the legs of the statue to go into the harbor? Yeah, that's Bravos. Bravos. And the Colossus, I think it's called the Colossus of Bravos or whatever they called it. It's an exact representation. It's a, a, an exact knockoff of the Colossus of Rhodes. Yeah, the Colossus of Rhodes was this gigantic, it, it was in Greece, right? It was this gigantic statue mm-hmm. that people would, they would sail under it, right? Yeah. Yeah, you could. I mean, it broke 
maybe three times. I mean, you build something that amazing, uh, the earthquake situation is going to be tricky. But I don't remember what the estimated dimensions were, but <laughs> the representations I've seen from artists, uh, it's just massive. I, I, I can't even fathom how they did it. I can't either. Yeah, I, I would love to learn more about bronze sculptures. Wasn't there someone in Lander that did that? Yeah, wow, great memory, man. It, it seems like every time we get on the phone like this, there's something that came up in super passing that I would never expect you to remember, and you remember. Good attention paying. Yeah, there's a, a place called Eagle Bronze. It's a foundry in Lander, and that's why you've got just tons of sculpture all around the town. And, and a lot of the, the bronze sculpture that's really popular down south in Colorado gets done in Lander. And these are it's an amazing process. There aren't too many things that I'm just positive would capture your attention as your mind races between interesting thing to the next interesting thing. But that bronze foundry process, I think, would absolutely enrapture you. Real quick, something I just looked at on the Colossus uh, Wikipedia page, it looks like they're going to rebuild the statue of Colossus. Huh. What? Yeah, it looks like uh, it says... In 2008, they started talking about it, and it looks like in 2015, a group of European architects announced plans to build a modern colossus. Really? Destroying two piers at the harbor entrance. Does it say why? I don't know, but it sounds awesome. <laughs> it sounds awesome. It would cost $283 million, provided by donations and crowdsourcing. That would be awesome. I'm kicking in on that. I am too, man. I'll straight up make a video to raise <laughs> to raise money for that stuff. Doesn't that sound awesome? I want to rebuild all the ancient wonders. Why don't we just get started on that? That'd be cool. That's man. incredible. By the way, we haven't talked about the Sphinx and how Napoleon shot the nose off the Sphinx. Did Napoleon shot the nose off the Sphinx? I don't I don't know if I'd heard that one. Yeah, I thought that's why yeah, the French when Napoleon was in Egypt, he used the Sphinx as target practice. Is that not right? Is that true? I guess I just always assumed that was Maybe erosion? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm I'm no, I'm looking that up because that's like that's like ISIS level crap right there. I already have a few bones to pick with Napoleon. That's that's I, what I'm happened. Straight, I'm I'm looking it up. Let's see. Just Drawings like of the Sphinx, many folk folk tales regarding destructions of his nose. One tale erroneously attributes it to cannonballs fired by the army of Napoleon Bonaparte. Ah. Okay. Napoleon was sophisticated, man. I just could not see him. Signing off on crap like that. So that that did not happen. Okay. I'm glad that was apocryphal. That that was troubling me. <laughs> I, I'm glad. Here, here's my guess. The, there is a, a long period of wind and uh, rain, and then eventually it fell off because it kind of protrudes and would be, it would yeah. have more surface area exposed to the elements. I like that story better. That's an issue with um, with statues, things that are cantilevered. So if you have a protrusion that's out and it's unsupported from below, that's an issue because you have a bending moment there. Can you just define the word cantilevered for me? Cantilever? Cantilever is when yeah. you have something protruding forward without anything underneath it. So there's a bending stress in the structure itself, naturally. And so if I took like a stick and stuck it between the ground and the protrusion, it is no longer cantilevered. Ground in a protrusion. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. If you, you supported okay. it from okay. below. Right. Oh, you know what? I, I see that all the time in uh, trout sculptures. Yeah, you know, There are exactly. people who carve wood trouts or, or do like, like kind of plasticized trout. And that's always it. There's a little blade of grass or uh, even fly line uh, yep. with um, some kind of epoxy around it that just taps the bottom of the sculpture. Yep. Exactly. I get it. Huh. How about that? Anyway, statues are awesome. I love huge statues. Uh, Christ the Redeemer was interesting. Um, I do this thing every time I go to a statue that's like an upright statue of a person standing or something along that those lines. Mm -hmm. Where have you ever seen these pictures of people at the Leaning Tower of Pisa where they're like holding the the Leaning Tower up? That's the selfie you get there. <laughs> so, yes, I have. That's not basic at all. So I do that at other statues. Like I have. Yeah, that, are, that are standing up perfectly fine. Yeah, like the Statue of Liberty. I, <laughs> I took a picture of me holding the Statue of Liberty up, and I've got one of me at Christ the Redeemer holding Christ the Redeemer up. It's just a little joke. I, I think it's funny. <laughs> and if okay, I, yeah, I'm charmed by if, it. And if I ever do make it to the gigantic Leaning Tower of Pisa, I'm gonna just going to like take a normal picture there. Yeah, that's what you should do. It's what everyone should do. Have you seen the pictures of 
the people from the wrong forced perspective angle of like a hundred people in a field. Yep. Leaning against something that isn't there. <laughs> like it's just, yeah, it's awesome. It's marvelous. <laughs> Goobers. Come on. So uh, the one the one you always get at Mount Rushmore, of course, is George Washington's nose getting picked. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, I see what you're doing. You're doing the thing. There's one statue that I've wanted to see, but obviously for <laughs> for very difficult reasons, I haven't been there. It's in Mongolia. It is this oh. gigantic statue of Genghis Khan. Oh, have, have you heard of this one? Yes. Yes. Wow. I don't think about Mongolia very often. I had not thought about that in this conversation. Yeah. What's that made out of? I have no idea. Oh, wait. Here. It says stainless steel. What? Stainless steel. That's amazing. Okay. I'm pulling it up. I want to know. Yeah. That, that's insane. And you know what's crazy is the building underneath it is meant to be reminiscent of like Hadrian's mausoleum or the mausoleum of Augustus and his family where Tiberius and Claudius would have also been buried. I think it's getting fancied up in Rome. But yeah, they didn't just accidentally make a base for that thing. That is huge. That's taller than the Colossus of Rhodes. 131 foot tall statue. What's awesome is it's in the middle of nowhere. It's like on in the, is it called the step? Really? Yeah, it's... Well, yeah. My understanding is it's just like in this wide open field and there's nothing around it. It just looks awesome. That's amazing. Yeah, this is almost how you pictured uh, Mount Rushmore. It is. I want to come back to the question of why these things happen and why they're not happening right now. We got sidetracked when we discovered that somebody was maybe thinking of putting the Colossus of Rhodes back up. And I would say that's happening because of... Renewed interest in Greek history and Greek pride and, you know, let's remind the world that we were the ones who came up with so many of these things, like math that you need to know to be able to do this kind of stuff. But why do you think we're not building some giant new sculpture to something in the United States? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it's, are we too selfish or are we not prideful enough? (laughs) <laughs> like, what is it? Like, what, do you build a big statue like this when you're super prideful and united as a, as a people? Like, look how awesome we are, like the Tower of Babel kind of thing? Or do you do it when you think about ideals that are bigger than yourself? Well, when, when does a statue like this happen? Uh, yeah. And is it people don't want to top the Statue of Liberty? They think, oh, wow, that's, that's an amazing statue. Why would we ever want to do anything to compare to that? Nah, historical hubris says you always try to make things that are better than the last thing. You think? That, that's that's the only part of your answer I'm skeptical of. Yeah, you always try to outdo the other people because the people who you know, came before us, they did some nice stuff, but if they're so smart, why are they dead? We're I mean, the, the best generation the things ever because we're alive. The things we've been building are like the International Space Station. That's pretty good. One of the most complicated things ever made by humans, period. Yeah. Well, what's so interesting about it yeah. is it... <laughs> it actually falls back to earth. And if we don't reboost it every so often, like it could deorbit. So, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I don't know. We, we should make a statue on the moon. Let's make a statue on the moon, dude. Uh, we, you know what, rather than you and I theorizing about what the statue on the moon should be, like what's the one thing that should go there. I think we should see what the third chair comes up with. I think a statue on the moon would be awesome. The James Webb space telescope is going to go out to L2 it's just going to, L2 is a Lagrangian point. It's going to stay there. Like, it's not going to deorbit. Well, I mean, we're going to have great, amazing achievements of human ingenuity in different locations. But I think what's so amazing about the Statue of Liberty is it's just right there so you can see it. Like, oh, yeah, there's that thing. We're all united on that thing, Liberty. Uh, well, and that's, a, that, I think you just nailed it. The more I listen to you talk about it, the more I think that's why we used to do this stuff and why we will again someday. It's because we agreed. Like everybody thought liberty was a really good idea in the 19th century and 18th century coming after the Civil War. Now, even though I don't agree with this position, a lot of people really sense the Statue of Liberty went up. That's about the exact time when it became a little more fashionable to think that liberty was a bit too dangerous. I think it's dangerous. I just think it's worth it. I think it's a dangerous system and it's the best system of any you can have to just build everything around human freedom as much as possible. I know and respect that people disagree with me on that, but I don't think we're going to be building a lot of monuments to liberty right now because I don't think we have the universal agreement as to the importance of liberty that we once did. I think we value 
uh, security or notions of fairness, whether one might think those are good notions of fairness or misguided could be debated. But because of that, I mean, everything's 50-50, everything. And 50-50 doesn't get stuff like this built. Can you imagine if um, the people who like Barack Obama decided to commission another mountain in the Black Hills to, to be carved in the likeness of Barack Obama? Or if the people who like Donald Trump were like, no, we're going to do one of Donald Trump. Just those would grind to a halt before they ever happened. Not because there aren't enough people who like those two presidents. There are plenty of people who like those two presidents, but because of how many people don't like what those presidents represent. And I'm not sure there's anything we do right now that there's a few enough amount of people who are opposed to it that you could make it happen. And that's why I don't think it's happening right now. Not a good use of money. Not enough agreement. Yeah, that, that was a challenge that uh, Bartoli had to overcome for the Statue of Liberty or Liberty Enlightening the World. How so? I mean, there's a lot of people like, man, this is a lot of money. Why? Why do we use this for them? You, you know, but as it started happening, like with any of these projects, like as it becomes big and huge and, and actually in front of you, more people become interested. Like I didn't. You know, if I, if I were to give the Crazy Horse Monument right now, I'd be like, wow, that's amazing. I want to kick in on this. There's these people doing this thing. But at some point, when you come up with an idea of like, hey, let's let's take a whole island right outside of New York and let's, let's put this mm-hmm. huge statue there. At some point, you sound like a crazy person. <laughs> yeah. And unless, yeah. unless you just start doing the thing, people are just going to keep looking at you like you're an idiot. And then even when you start doing it, they're going to look at you like you're an idiot. But then when they realize, oh, snap, this person's for Rizzle, at that point, <laughs> that's, snap for Rizzle. <laughs> that's when people Thank are going to jump on board. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I can assure you of this. Far more statues have been proposed than have been built. Yeah. I think you're right. That's the most obvious thing anybody's going to say all day. But, but, there, but there's meaning to that statement. No, 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 no. But, but it's, it's an interesting point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's there's also the uh, the uh, there's that thing in the Bible cons- the person that considers a tower to be built. Do you remember that one? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you got to plan all this out, and you got to figure out exactly how you're going to do it and and go all the way. So I don't know. I think that's the thing. It's like the, the, you have to have an idea big enough for people to unite around. You have to have just a little bit of crazy in you to want to do it, mm-hmm. and, and you have you to have be to count willing. The cost. Yeah, you count the cost, and you have to be willing to just go all in and be like, hey, this is happening. You guys are on board or you're not, but it's happening either way. Yeah, you got to understand people are going to hate it. Yeah, exactly. I particularly like the Statue of Liberty, especially learning probably more about it listening to you than I I knew beforehand coming in in total. I particularly like the element of like, like the two great Western liberal revolutions are ours and the French – you know, as we discussed the other day talking about Lafayette. And I kind of like that that statue is a transatlantic high five. Uh, yeah, I mean, we've kind of gone different directions and had different reads on things since. But it was cool that we were like, hey, you know, this is a place where our heritages profoundly overlap and we owe things to each other on this. And hey, you know, go Liberty Bros. Yeah, I agree. I guess what I'm trying to say with that is I like that that statue comes with an added degree of unity and cross-culturalism, whereas maybe some of the uh, some of the statues that get proposed and go nowhere are more of just a monument to myself or my thing or my group. It seems like one of the things that really makes these projects happen as we talk them through is that they're bigger than just a moment of boasting and pride, and they bring other people along for the ride. <laughs> Hey, Matt, this is Destin from the future. I have something to tell you. Remember I was talking about the oh. statue on the moon? Yeah, I remember that. It's so weird that, I mean, because you still sound just like you. I know, but I'm not me from the past. I'm me from the future. Turns out there is a statue on the moon right now. A little statue or like one I could see from here? Uh, yeah, it's a little statue, but there is a statue on the moon, and that's important. It's called Fallen Astronaut. And it's made out of aluminum. It's about three and a half inches. It's, it's just this little bitty astronaut with no arms. And um, it's just laying 
right there in the regolith, laying on the ground on the moon, and uh, the astronauts from Apollo 15 left it there. Isn't that interesting? Apollo 15, what, what year was that? What time frame? Uh, 1971, they dropped it on August 1st, and I know that from memory, not okay. from the thing I'm reading in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, they um, Still counts. it's pretty interesting. They, they had this little plaque, and they left the plaque right there in the dirt on the moon, and uh, this little statue, and what's so cool about it is it, w- it was left there by American astronauts, but it had the names of all the people that have gone before and died in the pursuit of space exploration. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there, there were cosmonauts from the Soviet Union on there. I mean, I, I don't know all the names on it here, but that's a... That's a Which is a, a bigger deal than a modern audience would appreciate. In 1971, that is an, an incredible gesture of goodwill. Yeah, it is. It is. I, well... Actually, on the Wikipedia page, there is a list of of all the different um, all the different astronauts and cosmonauts on there. Yeah, they've got some from okay the Apollo One fire uh, that you may recall the the astronauts that died on the pad, and then you have several from aircraft uh, accidents, and then you've got some guys here from the uh, Soyuz Eleven reentry pressurization failure. So that's I wonder if we'll update that. Uh. I don't know. I mean, I, I think it would be appropriate. I think it would be appropriate. I think it would be appropriate too. Yeah. So yeah, the reason I asked about the size is because you know we're talking about monuments, gigantic stuff. But what's interesting is this is kind of a different animal because one, well, there's nobody there to mess with it or vandalize it, and two, I mean, obviously we don't really have the ability to haul gigantic, you know, <laughs> Ninevite Lamasau up to uh, up to the moon or anything. And so really effectively, that little plaque and that little statue in that environment kind of accomplished the same thing as a gigantic megalithic thing that you're going to see for a thousand years. Yeah, just because of the, sit there for a thousand years. the effort that it took to get it there, I mean, is, is similar to the effort it would take here on Earth to create such a large, uh, I don't know, a large landmark. I don't know what you want to call it. L- let me ask you this, Maybe though. greater effort. Yeah, perhaps greater. L- let me ask you this, Whitman. If, if you today... Or, you know, 20 years from now when there's more gray hair and grew wiser or whatever, you know, Lord willing. I like the idea that I could have hair later. <laughs> gray beard, whatever. So Fine. What, um, what would be your statue? What would be your monument that you would build or you would lead a people in building to preserve some type of idea or something that you would, you would cast forward into future generations? What would be your monument? What would it look like? What would you build it out of? Why would you build it out of those things? I don't know. Have you ever thought about such a thing? Yeah, and I think people might expect my answer to that to be something religious, but I'm not sure that's the kind of thing that you really capture with a monument. I know there there are certainly expressions of religion and Christianity that are more into that than I am. Um, There's a really cool monument to the Reformation in Geneva with these really just cool stylish carvings of the big names in the swiss reformation well, and that's neat hold on wait 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 so, I don't know. pause what, what is it I, i'm not aware of this uh i think they just call it the reformation monument in geneva switzerland huh it's, it's in a kind of like a flower garden park thing okay it's pretty neat like, like when i was there you know I'm, I'm taking pictures next to those guys i've read all about them they are kind of giants in the history of a, a religious intellectual movement but i kind of think the monument that i would really want to make that would transcend cultural boundaries and everything else is the one that you just went and saw sitting in, uh, in New York. I mean, it's, it's a monument to what I think is genuinely the greatest social human innovation in all of history. And that is the liberal West. I think it, it is the best solution to what ails humanity that we've ever been able to come up with. It's a better solution than the absolute monarchs that came before it. It's a better solution than, I think, utopian but failed ideas that have been proposed since. I think there's really something to that unique, uh, limited state, individual freedom, tolerance for all ideas, even ones that you really reject, kind of values that that were the Western experiment. And yeah, I, I think that to me is the most moving set of ideas Outside of ones I don't think I can capture with a monument, those being ideas surrounding my faith. What about you? Before I 
answer the question, I, I want to unpack, you know, what you just said. Basically, you said you'd build the Statue of Liberty. Yep. So think about this. I was in the drive through to the Chinese restaurant yesterday. Okay. And as as I was pulling up and I saw the word China up on the uh up on the restaurant there, I was thinking, you know, those Chinese, man, th- that whole nation, they're just yeah, they just their government's just so jacked up. The way they don't like freedom, <laughs> you know, the way they're not us because we've got everything figured out. You know what I mean? Yeah, I was kind of having, uh, was kind of having one of those a very strange trip through the drive-through. <laughs> okay, I was gonna, I was having one of those moments, you know, like we we've got it all figured out, and then I thought, you know, we don't have it figured out, but we're we the West, we're we're trying really hard to have individual freedoms and liberties, and then I thought to myself, what would happen if suddenly overnight China just goes, you know what, we're into freedom now, like all the way. Individual freedoms, and I thought about an individual person in a city in China and how they interact with their government now, and I thought, what if all of that changed overnight, and suddenly the largest beacon of freedom in the world was China? Just think about this for a second. I've been thinking about this with what's going on in Hong Kong. What's standing right? in the way of that? Is is it the people in power in the government? Is it the uh, Is it the people not really wanting or having the the will to to stand up and and grab that freedom for themselves is it fear what is it but if it were to happen tomorrow what would that do to the mentality of americans or or people from the uk what would happen to everyone's mindset and how they view china like if they meant it if it was for realsies well if it's for realsies uh, I don't know. That's hard to game out. I, a lot of times when, you know, I, I sit and compare notes with people who think different things uh, just about the state of the world. And, and you know, my views are quirky. They sure weren't quirky in the late 18th or early 19th century. I mean, in, you know, France and the northern half of the United States, my views were, well, frankly, very popular <laughs> at that point in history. But now, you know, just the way things have evolved, there, there's always a human impulse toward authority and central planning. And I get that. And I respect that impulse, even if it's not my favorite. And people like to pick my brain about it. And one of the things that I always have to explain is like, if you made me king tomorrow, I wouldn't go make some libertarian utopia. A whole bunch of promises have been made. You can't just force everyone with the power of the state to do business this way and do that. And you can't build there and you can't build there and regulation and all of this other stuff. And then just the next day, break all the promises to deliver on this or or to mess with business over here like you'd have to be really thoughtful about what had been done in the past to make it so that the advent of increased freedom was something that actually helped people in the short term not just some celebration of an ideal and i'm sorry if this really hurts really badly so i mean it would be a, a quick weaning process if i were king of everything which i never want to be but you kind of have to honor the reality you got dealt and I think if that happened with China, I think it would be, it'd be a mess right off the bat if there was no plan for come, how to come off of maximum modern communist authoritarianism to liberal westernism. I mean, it's just, it's just not going to work overnight. And so, one, I think it would be very, very difficult to make such a change, even if the impulse was there. I think the generational knowledge of how to do that has been largely lost and would have to be rediscovered in a place like that. And so I think I think what would happen is there'd be a lot of people who'd be like, see, freedom's a terrible idea. Look at what a tough time that they're having. I think there would be other people in the West, you know, Australia, Canada, Western Europe, us, who would look at, and I'm leaving out Latin America, the West. I think there'd be a ton of other people who would look at that and say, uh, we got to get our butts in gear. Tolerance and a, a liberal ideology of pluralism and respecting other people's points of view and freedom is it's really hard to maintain and it erodes really quickly and maybe we should be doing more of that. I, I think it would light a fire under us in a good way. I would hope for a good transition to something like that for a people coming off of maximum authoritarianism. I don't know, man. I, I just think with the economic um, potential that China has, and the right set of ideas, they would be impressive. 
They would be. They're uh, already impressive. They are impressive. You know exactly what I'm trying to say. They they would be I, incredible. Just imagine all <laughs> all how many billion are in China now? I, I don't know. I don't know. It's. I don't think it's two. No, it would just be impressive, and it's possible. And the, and the only thing that's standing in the way is inertia of ideas. Or is that a thing? Yeah, I, I think I'm tracking with you. I mean, that's what I was kind of referencing. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I, I mean, you made certain deals. You made people dependent on certain situations, and it'll take a minute to have the benefits of economic liberty and individual liberty start to show up economically. Did you see the news where the state-run media in China is starting to use essentially deep fakes for their news broadcasters? Yes, I did. They digitize the news broadcasters, and then they can make that person say whatever they want, and they work 24-7. They don't have to rest now. We can just put the words into the computer, and then the news broadcaster will read the news on the TV. That blew my mind, dude. I don't think we need to get Mark Coddington back on the phone in order to um, <laughs> intuit the problems with such an arrangement. It's just a puppet. It's just that, a that, very... and, and, and I know everybody's always like, that's 1984. That's 1984. But if you think that's about exactly it, exactly, it. it's it's not a whole lot different than what's going on in the printed word now. Anyway, I, I found I found that to be interesting. And as I was getting my sesame chicken and our dumplings and our wonton soup. Do you go wonton or egg drop? Which which soup do you go for? Egg drop every time. Man, I really like that sesame chicken. I know what place you're talking about. Oh yeah. I did I did egg drop until I got married and then she really likes wonton and I just I don't know. I started liking wonton because you get like this little dumpling thing every time. It's pretty good. Yeah, I, I can respect it. I just like the egg drop. <laughs> so anyway, th- that was a, a, a deep moment I had personally. I was like, man, if if the Chinese just went full bore freedom, like immediately, they'd be pretty awesome, but they're not. (laughs) So all the systems cannot preclude human weakness, human frailty, human evil. But of all the systems, I think individual freedom does the best. And I know there are people who are listening who are like, no, absolutely not. Central planning is the way to work it. Uh, Cool. We can agree to disagree on that. And that's the beauty of having freedom. Where would you make your statue? Probably my house. <laughs> I don't know. There's a, I mean, there's a lot of big monuments to things here, right where I live. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Um, Tiananmen Square might be where I'd like to have that. Maybe Pyongyang, Havana, Cuba. You know what I really like when you drive into Alabama on Inter- Interstate hmm. 65? The huge rocket. Like you come across the state line from Tennessee into Alabama, and you're like, hey, let's go to the idiot state. And then you roll up, and there's this gigantic Saturn IV B, I believe it is. You're like, whoa. Yes. That's cool. Yeah. It's just this giant rocket being like, hey, rockets and stuff, roll tide. <laughs> so, yeah, it's funny because there aren't a lot of there aren't a lot of northern states that have just scores uncountable of people who would know how to build that. It's kind of an Alabama thing. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it, you there's no one person that knows how to build a rocket. Yeah, nobody knows that even how to build a mouse, and it's a lot simpler than a rocket. Uh, yeah, that's true. But I'm just sticking up for you. That's all I'm saying. Thank you. I know you're going to try to be modest. The point is, yes, that was the reputation I had heard of Alabama as well. And yes, that rocket sitting right there on the interstate the first time I drove by it was certainly a challenging juxtaposition to my assumptions. And when I saw the rocket, I have to admit, my smug, superior, I'm so much smarter than everybody else thing was challenged. So it's a good monument. It's a good monument. It's a really good monument. It's like, whoa, that's cool. So I don't know. I, I, I've thought about it. I, I would probably build something like that, I think. Something that points towards human progress in general. The, the cool thing about a rocket is that it, it's not about a political statement or anything of those, you know, th- those qualities. It's more about, hey, we as humans, we can reach for higher or farther things. That's the exact same thing that my monument would celebrate. Yeah? Yeah? Well, think about it. I mean, we're saying the same thing. I don't... This is yours as a physical manifestation. Mine is an ideological. Yeah. I think I could buy off on that. I think yours is more of a statement about not oppressing others. And I think mine would be more of a statement of working together to do a thing. 
no, nah, no, nah, I can't let you frame mine as a negative. It's not that. The negative aspect of what I believe, which is actually a positive, which is cut other people some slack, like, like the negative rights aspect of what I believe, like you have the freedom to think things, say things, be your own person. That is a positive progress throughout history because tribalism means we don't naturally do that. It takes unity and agreement that those ethics of of tolerance and care and individual liberties are important in order for those things to really be preserved without them being oppressed by other people. So I would argue that both of these ideas are expressions of humanity moving forward toward being able to think beyond the automatic default setting, our, our, our normal constraints that we deal with. I think there could be a, a less violent civilization than how we used to do it back in the day. I think that we could do human tolerance for uh, people of different tribes. I think we could pull that off, and I think it could make for a beautiful, productive, virtuous future. That's what people thought back then. That's what I think now. You're talking about the same thing with rocketry and science and all of this stuff, that we could go from a place of being physically limited within the constraints of nature to learning more about how nature works, to even being able to mess with it and participate in it in new ways to open new horizons. I think they're both very forward-looking monuments that we're talking about. But one's a rocket. I think you missed that. I think you missed that part. <laughs> no, no, I didn't. Miss it. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm with you. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I think these these two things are huge. One other statue I want to mention briefly because I think you'd love it. Have you ever been to Cincinnati? Yes, I have been to Cincinnati, but I have not seen the statue that you're about to tell me about. Down by the river, there is uh, it's not a van down by the river, but down by the river there is a statue of Cincinnatus. Mm-hmm. The Roman general, I guess you could say. Was he a general? Yeah. Who the, the last time we talked about him, I had him placed in the wrong part of Roman history. But yeah. Yeah. The, the Roman general who, like Sulla, punted on power. It's really cool because it's a huge statue of him plowing a field right by the river. Hmm. And it's cool because it's like, hey, I, I could have been emperor of all of Rome, but no, I, I relinquish that power. I'm just going to chill. So that's... uh. Tolkien was clearly influenced by Cincinnatus and other such stories and what he crafted as the ideal person in his storytelling. Last question. So this Statue of Liberty All that right. you're going to build at your house, um, what, yeah. what would you make it out of? So I'll give you some options. You've got stone. Okay. You've got mm-hmm. stone. You could quarry the stone you know, nearby. You could get the stone from somewhere else. We also have metals that you could use, bronze, iron, whatever, gold, I don't know. Let's just pretend you have access to whatever you want. Stone, uh, dirt, you could pile up dirt, you could make clay bricks, you could do things of that nature. What would you build this out of and why? Wonderful question. Wonderful question. Stuff means stuff. Every one of those things, every one of those materials means something different. If I build it out of gold, I'm flexing the muscles and saying, look, these ideas of liberal tolerance and and individual liberty, they produce wealth better than anything else. So in that respect, it would kind of be a a middle finger to other proposals for how to do economics and produce human capital. So if you build it out of gold, it means that. If you build it out of stone, what you're saying is this is utterly timeless. This is a, a truth you know, back to the idea of, of natural rights. This is a truth that is baked in to the creation of existence and is self-evident. If you make it out of wood, you're saying this is a, a truth that was there in a nascent form. The, the, the DNA, the code pack was there, but it grew up into something that took time to develop slowly over years as a tree it takes time to grow from a tiny little thing into something big and dramatic. If we were to build it out of steel using the components of modernism, what we're saying is the modern age was built on these ideas. Or if we build it out of stuff that's even more technologically advanced to make it look sleek and futuristic and maybe even integrated elements that were technological, even computerized and electronic, what that says is these ideas might seem antiquated to you, but these are the ideas that will carry us forward into our technological future. So whatever you build it out of really is loaded with meaning, and I would like more time to think about it. I think what I would build it out of would depend on who I was building it for. 
If I'm building it as a pushback against critics, I might build it out of something different. If I was building it simply as a proactive statement about the beauty of things, I think I'd like to make something like that out of wood. Maybe we could find some way to preserve it long term, but maybe you build it out of wood because each generation needs to build another one to revitalize this tree or plant new ones for this tree of uh, these Western liberal tolerance ideas. What would you build your rocket out of? <laughs> I don't know that it would be a rocket. <laughs> I, I would um, I, I would do a, a large-scale research project and figure out the best metallurgical uh, materials that, that would do what I want, which is stay there forever. So, for example, hmm. you can build something out of stainless steel— but so it, plastic straws. <laughs> yeah, good pl- ketchup packets and plastic straws. <laughs> you can build something out of stainless steel, which is what I've always thought would make sense for your headstone. Like, uh, for example, I actually, I actually put monuments on the missile range one time. You know, I showed up and I inherited a survey system from the the forties and fifties. There were these little survey markers all over the range. And I said, you know, I'm going to install monuments in the ground, in concrete, at certain locations so that we know exact positions of things as we survey them. Because literally, there was a guy named Norm, and Norm knew where all the survey rods were on the range. And you'd say, hey, Norm, I need you to survey this. And he'd go, he'd go dig around in the grass, and he'd find a little bitty stob in the ground, and he would measure from it. And he'd go, okay, yeah, you know, you're North Alabama, you know, you know, there's there's a whole we could have a whole conversation about surveying on Earth. That's a that's a thing. So North Alabama, oh, we should do that. Eighty four East. You know, according to Nat eighty four, this is where you're at. It's like okay, cool. So I was like, you know, Norm is the only one that knows all this stuff, and when Norm goes, it's all gone. So I'm going to reestablish everything. So I only dug up one of Norm's monuments, and that was the datum at Range Zero, and I created these eight inch discs out of stainless steel. And I had an option. I was like, I can write the name of our organization on this, or I could do something bigger. And so what I, what I decided to do is I looked at the patch for the Army Test Evaluation Command at the time, and it had this sword on it, and it was it stood for truth. And I, I said, you know, about 15 years ago, our organization changed names. I bet it's going to change names again. So I decided to not put any words about who we were on it. And I just, um, I, I had these discs milled with a CNC mill in right in the side of stainless steel. I had a sword put on them with our patch, our logo, which stood for truth. And it had a seesaw that stood for uh, measuring truth. And I had that milled in there. And I had a, a crosshair. And then I had a, uh, a compass rose on there, put on there. And so it just oriented to the earth. And it stood for truth. And it had a spot where you could measure from. That's all I did. And within 10 years, the organization changed names. And I thought to myself, man, I'm very glad I didn't do that, you know? <laughs> and it was, you know, I was a young man and I, I, it, was, it was quite a stretch for me to think that far ahead. Yeah, it's pretty intuitive. And I, I love that the truth, I mean, you've mentioned that to me before, not the, the monument thing. I didn't know about any of this, but you've mentioned the truth thing before. And I just love in your line of work that that was or is the motto. Don't give me any political loadedness. Don't give me any opinion or debate. These are systems designed to defend people in life and death situations. We need to know exactly what it does, exactly how it works to the nth degree. And so what I really liked about visiting your job is it felt like it was this place where, yeah, sure, everybody brings their preferences and ideas in with them. But we have got to get legit accuracy on this. It must just be true, and that's all we, we're concerned with. Oh, yeah. And so I think, I think you captured the essence of it the right way. Well, thank you for the compliment, but I did make a mistake. So What did you do? I, I decided at each individual monument, I, I made 20-something of these, and I put them all over the range in hard-to-reach places and very obvious places. And uh, we would go out with post hole diggers, and we'd dig a couple of feet down in the ground, and we would— we would pour just a ton of concrete and put J bolts in the bottom of these stainless steel discs. And then um, I, I left a plate on each one where we could mill out of stainless steel again. We could mill out the exact coordinates for each individual location. And you could screw these plates down to the disc. 
and it, it was countersunk so that it would stay in there and water wouldn't get under it and freeze and stuff like that. But what I didn't take into account is when you take dissimilar metals and you and you put them together, you have an issue called galvanic action. Have you ever heard of this? Okay. Mm-hmm. And the galvanic action will corrode things that normally you don't expect to, to corrode each other. And so long story short, the fact that I created two pieces of metal that touched each other in the open exposed elements was a problem. So on my fancy monument that I'm going to make in our fictitious, you know, we have all the money we want to make whatever statement we want to the future generation, I probably wouldn't use a lot of words, and I probably would not bolt things together. I would try to to weld them together and make them as monolithic as possible and also try to make it um, just with as few seams or creases where water could get into it as possible so that it wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't get a little bit of water in there in the wintertime and it freeze and it expands and contracts. I would try to think about sure. things like uh, expansion and contraction with thermal issues. I try to make it really thick. Yeah, and the most obvious place where you're going to get that, you said it was called galvanic action? Yes, sir. Or corrosion? Is going to be where you use a screw or a bolt of one material to run through another material. I mean, probably you're just not going to think about that, but the material would need to match. That's what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. Any any kind of junction is bad. Hmm. So anyway, that, that's that's the kind of thing I would think about when I made my monument. In fact, it's what and I... And where would you put your monument? I'd go to the highest mountain I could find that was some type of stone, and I would use that as the as the foundation for the monument. And then, of course, I would run a lightning rod down it. <laughs> the Franklin rods are important. So I think that's what I would do. But it, I mean, I mean, so the, the highest mountain you can find is, is Mount Everest. It's really, really tall. But I, I mean, I, mean, I you want to go with maybe something where people could still see it. Okay. Yeah. Good point. Good point. So I don't think Everest would be good. There's, there's too much thermal changes there that, yeah, you can't get there. There's no oxygen, all that kind of thing. I, I would go in, in a populated area near a river where I think civilization would last for a long time, or a harbor, something like that, probably go a, at least a couple hundred feet above above sea level. If you heard about these stones in Japan where they said, hey, there was a tsunami, and it went up to this level. You heard about that? Yes. Yeah, I have. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's that's a, a later generation, or an earlier generation trying to talk to the future generation. So I would probably go a couple hundred feet above sea level for multiple reasons, at least, and, and try to be near freshwater, a, a large source of, of freshwater. The Mississippi River, for example, might be a great place. I don't know where. Or the Tennessee River. Somewhere that's probably going to be there for quite a while. Yeah, that's what I think I would do. All right. I would like to do a, a lengthier conversation at some point about monuments we don't understand Ooh, from the past. Like Stonehenge kind People of thing? People made stuff. Yeah, they were t- maybe trying to talk to future generations. And we don't know what's the, exactly the thing in Georgia, like the guide stone or something like that. Yes. What the heck is that thing? And that's relatively recent, but I want to know. Yeah. I, I know of a couple others as well. We should compare notes on that sometime in the future. I'm game, man. Yeah. That sounds good. By the way, there was a part of a rocket for sale at Marshall Space Flight Center and you could, they would like give it to you for free if you would transport it. No joke. Really? Yeah. I've actually done something like that before. There was a tank. Um, I, I had to do a ton of paperwork, but I figured out a way to get a M60 tank for the local veterans monument in my town. And, uh, it was, it was quite the chore to get it all figured out, but I did all the paperwork and we were able to get that thing put in the local veterans memorial park. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. I went and saw it with you. Yeah. So I had to, I had to weld the turret. Oh, that's right. Yeah. No, I would have totally forgot that you did that if you if you hadn't mentioned it. Yeah, that's right. I remember you I remember you showing me that. It was, that's quite the accomplishment. It was really, really neat. The hardest part about that was uh there were these sites on the inside of those things that used tritium, if I believe, some type of radioactive material. And you had to get a, a federal radiographic scan. I just I don't even know if those are the words. You had to get somebody with a Geiger counter to go scan the tank to be like, Yep, this is not nuclear, whatever. You're good. And um, good. that was the hardest thing we had to do. Kids play on that. Yeah. So thanks for talking about this. This is really fun. 
yeah, it's a fun topic. Let's uh, let's do a gazillion more this year. <laughs> let's let's do a gazillion more fun topics. I like that. All right, cool, buddy. All right, buddy. Yeah, we'll talk to you soon, my friend. Take care. Later, man.